Hello, and welcome to Fotana 2021 Pulse, presented by the School of Design and Production at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. I'm Eric Rimes, the Director of the Lighting Department. I've been working at UNCSA since 2003, and for the last 19 years, Fotana has been a cherished part of our program. Our students come here to do what they love, we present Photonapalooza as a way to showcase the talents of our fourth year lighting students. All our lighting students worked incredibly hard to produce this presentation together tonight. Photana this year is entitled Pulse. The fourth year designers chose to look at the ways we have all been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Observing the pain and beauty that come with the severity of a situation like the pandemic allows individual growth and pushes artists to communicate both personal and universal experiences. This is the heart of what we do, creating and communicating. This past year has shown an increasing reliance on art as a sense of connection and escape. Technology has proven essential for productivity and communication between people in a way that was not previously realized in a global format. This is the future, and we constantly strive to educate our students in preparation for advancing technology. If you're interested in the work you see here tonight, UNCSA and our program are always looking for talented and passionate individuals to apply and study their art with us. To learn more about joining us, visit uncsa.edu and click on admissions. Again, thank you for joining us tonight your support of the work we create is essential to the mission of UNCSA. Enjoy the show.
Hello, and welcome to Potana 2021 Pulse, presented by the School of Design and Production at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. I'm Eric Rimes, the Director of the Lighting Department. I've been working at UNCSA since 2003, and for the last 19 years, Potana has been a cherished part of our program. Our students come here to do what they love. We present Photana Palooza as a way to showcase the talents of our fourth year lighting students. All our lighting students worked incredibly hard to produce this presentation together tonight. Photana this year is entitled Pulse. The fourth year designers chose to look at the ways we have all been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Observing the pain and beauty that come with the severity of a situation like the pandemic allows individual growth and pushes artists to communicate both personal and universal experiences. This is the heart of what we do, creating and communicating. This past year has shown an increasing reliance on art as a sense of connection and escape. Technology has proven essential for productivity and communication between people in a way that was not previously realized in a global format. This is the future, and we constantly strive to educate our students in preparation for advancing technology. If you're interested in the work you see here tonight, UNCSA and our program are always looking for talented and passionate individuals to apply and study their art with us. To learn more about joining us, visit uncsa.edu and click on admissions. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Your support of the work we create is essential to the mission of UNCSA. Enjoy the show.
Hello, I'm Josh Sealander, Assistant Professor and Alumni of the Lighting Program here at UNCSA. Each year, we're fortunate enough to receive sponsorships and loan of leading industry standard lighting and video equipment to produce Photana. We're incredibly thankful for the donations this year from ETC, GLP, High End Systems, and World Stage. These allow our students to experience a larger variety of equipment giving them an unparalleled educational experience otherwise not available. This year, we've had to pivot to work in a smaller venue for multiple reasons, the obvious being a lack of in-person audiences. We're also very excited about the current renovation of the Performance Place Complex, a $6 million renovation that is scheduled to be completed in April. This will put lighting fixtures, consoles, and equipment that we've only ever dreamed of having in the hands of the students permanently on campus. We have roughly $530,000 of equipment that makes this year's show possible. Along with that, our students have spent months planning and developing and then redeveloping this year. All combined, it roughly totals upwards of 1,456 hours. So while this year might look different, it has still required the same dedication and commitment to creating an engaging experience like every year before it. We're so grateful for all of the factors that allow us to present Photana this year. Donations and loans such as these, the support of the university, and most importantly, the resilience of our students. It is a simplification to say that this year has been challenging for everyone. We come from a place of great privilege to be able to continue working with and educating our students in person. We would be amiss to gloss over all of the issues that have been intensified and for many brought to light by the pandemic. So for this Photana, our students wanted to be able to express their own experiences in this regard. Issues such as racial and economic inequity, challenges of communication and connection, the sense of community lost or found. With audio compositions created by fourth year students in the sound program, this Photana is a full expression of our students. We want to make sure that the lighting department is an inclusive environment that focuses on creating the art that we need to create and telling the stories that we feel compelled to tell. We want to make sure that we are not stagnant when the field and the world call for a movement forward. In an educational setting, working during a pandemic has certainly been an exercise of patience and compromise for students and faculty alike. But as always, our lighting students have faced these challenges head on and have worked incredibly hard to further their educational and artistic endeavors. Being able to continue to hold productions this year has been incredibly important for the education of our students. And while keeping a safe and healthy environment has always been a priority, it is especially important for the continuation of the hands-on education 
that our students require. Many of our fall productions have been filmed and are going to be released for you to view in the spring. This is possible because of the dedication of our students, faculty, and staff to fighting the spread of COVID-19. As you can tell, Photana looks a little different this year. In order to give you as close to an in-person experience as possible, our teams have pre-recorded their pieces and each of the graduating fourth year students will be here shortly after the show to talk about their piece and respond to any questions or comments that you leave in the live chat. Again, we are so happy that you're able to join us tonight to celebrate the work of our students. Now grab some snacks and a drink or a few, then sit back and enjoy the show. The Department of Lighting now presents Photana Pulse.
Hey, Josh. <laughs> oh. oh, there we go. All right, so I'm Josh Sealander. I am a professor here in the lighting program here at UNCSA. I'm going to moderate for our five um, fourth year uh, students. And I'm going to first do an introduction, and um, then we'll get into some Q&A. So if you do have questions, we invite you to go ahead and put that information, put those questions into the live chat on YouTube or on Facebook. So first up, I'm going to introduce Max Wirtz, who's the designer for Connection and Pandemic. Uh, next, we have Jake Frizzell, the designer for Communication. Next is Yuko Taniguchi, the designer for Inequity and Community. Jacob Rogers up next, the production electrician and programmer for Community. And Parker Battle, the programmer for Inequity. So I think first, what I think would be a really great topic to start with is talking about lighting your piece in person versus lighting your piece for a monitor. So let's kick that to, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pick Max first to start us out. So Max, well, yeah, I mean, go for it. Yeah, yeah, obviously um, we've spent three years learning how to light our pieces in person without ever really thinking about the impending doom that is lighting for a camera instead. Um, and really, it's not all that different. You're just looking at the same composition that you're looking at on the stage, except, you know, it's cropped in further, so there's actually less to worry about than if you're worrying about lighting a piece for the eye. And then the other main battle is um, compressing your dynamic range, because what I found is that cameras have a, you know, less of a dynamic range than our eyes, and so they can't see, like, the differences between something really low and really high. So you have to bring that dynamic range down to kind of low and kind of high. However, within that dynamic range, they can see the minute differences that we can't see. Um, so that's the main battle with it. And actually in the past six months, it's it's been um, less of a challenge than I truly anticipated, but still a challenge nonetheless. <laughs> okay. Yuko, would you, would you think that the audience tonight, did they did they see the same piece that you saw in the large light lab? Some parts, yes, some parts, no. Because of how much the camera, you know, the camera can only, you only see what's on the camera, what captures on the camera, on the, on the monitor. Whereas if you're working in person in the large lab, you see the entire composition. So it's kind of tricky when you're working in a large lab and you're lighting for the camera because you have the tendency to look at the space, but you also have to make sure that you know the audience who's actually going to see these pieces are watching what's on the camera. So that back and forth has been quite tricky to adjust. Yeah, I bet. It was definitely different for me to see the pieces in person versus seeing them you know, in all of the, the, the monitors that were in the lab. So next, I'm going to throw it to Jacob. Jacob, can you talk a little bit about the rig that is uh, a part of Photona this year? Yeah, so we were lucky enough to have um, high-end GLP and ETC donate equipment for us to use. And in re like as far as plenty of electrical and data, things weren't that different. Uh, um, the, a rig's a rig. The largest thing was learning the tricky situations that presents in our large lab. It's not meant to be a performance venue per se. So figuring out, you know, the spatial needs in order to accommodate tech tables and how to fit everyone in a COVID safe environment um, and still allow a production. Um, and then we rigged quite a few things from the sky. So the safety parameters of what we could and couldn't ground support versus from the mother grid. Um, that was the biggest change, I think, to the, to the light lab from an electrics perspective is um, outfitting it for how large the rig was in comparison to how we normally use it as a classroom. Okay. Yeah, I think this year we had uh, quite a bit hung from the grid and the large lab. Um, so it definitely added some, you know, some obstacles to what, you know, you guys had to work with. Um, there was certainly some, some elements that were also missing. Do you want to talk about that? Actually, I'm going to throw that to Jake. Do you want to talk about that? Talking about what didn't they see tonight? It? Yeah. Um, oh God. So I mean, so we talk about haze a lot, um, especially in these types of environments when we're showcasing 
uh, lighting like this. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, haze is an atmospheric effect. Uh, that's how you see those beams of light that create these kind of compositions. Um, part of the issue we have, and coming from someone who edited all the film together, um, it's really difficult to capture some of those effects. So one of the things I actually used that um, I was kind of disappointed I didn't get to the final product with was um, like an architectural beam of light. Um, so you can't see that over a camera necessarily because it's picking up so much more detail um, than the human eye is. So when we're in space, if you've been to previous Vatanas, you see a lot of these really beautiful like structural beams that look like sharp objects. Um, and so that was kind of hard this year because we're using haze, but you can't necessarily see it unless we're setting the fire alarms off. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. This Which year for happened. Sure. It happened do we have multiple a, times. Yeah, do we have a count of how many times we've set the fire alarm off during this Botana? I think that's something that we should have by the end it, of the Q&A. For sure. Yeah, we can give three us a time. Yeah. Oh, only more three. Than All right. Yeah, it was more than Max was the only one who didn't set it off. <laughs> There's a lot Good of pace job, involved with making a show like Botana. Um, yeah. So, Parker, what was part of the process in terms of, you know, being a programmer in the show? Talk a little bit about what your role was in, um, for those that uh, of the audience that don't know what a programmer is, let's talk about that. Yeah, so programmers taking all the lights, telling them what to do, where to move, communicating that from the designer. Uh, so we're taking, you know, the designer says, hey, I want, uh, you know, these lights to look like this, and we've got a translate that to actually make it happen on a computer um, and so a lot of things different than usual uh, is we're paying a lot more attention to color on the camera versus color in real life and trying to you know if they say they want cyan okay we may see a, a perfect cyan in our real <laughs> eyes but having to make that match on the camera uh, seeing fade times how things dim adjusting everything that it may not look the best to our eyes in person because we know the end product is the camera for this project. Yeah. So uh, we're focusing more on what it looks like on camera. Um, but I constantly had myself looking over at the camera uh, and seeing you know what things looked like there versus what things were actually in real life. So. Okay. And to piggyback off so, of Parker, sorry, I was going to say to piggyback off of Parker, um, for anyone who's following School of the Arts and different social media channels. Um, you've all, I'm sure you've seen that we've been doing a lot of productions this year virtually, um, posting them online. And I think all of us, Max Yuko and I and Jacob and everyone else involved, um, can really confirm that a lot of our associates and assistants who have previously worked on those shows who are programming specifically to the camera um, helped us tremendously in this process because we like to look at the physical object that we would be presenting. Uh, for me, that was Amanda in this situation. I know for everyone else, it was someone different. So I think that's an important part to acknowledge here. Okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the camera because that question's come up a few times. Who chose the angle? Did you have control of exposure, of color temp, of any of the settings in the camera? How did you guys as designers go about making those decisions? Uh, Max, you want to start us out? Yeah, sure. Um, so at the beginning of the process, we chose that main camera angle that's a little lower and kind of gets the, the majority of the composition as our teching angle because it gave us, as you know, I just said, the majority of the composition from the angle that we all liked. And then from there, we also set our exposure to an exposure that would give us at a very high haze level, um, a great relationship between the beams, the scenery on the ground, and then also the tiles in the back. And if, as I'm sure anybody who's a uh, theater technician or professional knows that when you're using an LED screen next to lighting, it's a nightmare. Um, so that was very important to us, was finding the relationship primarily between the LED screens and the rest of the lighting of the composition and even when we found that good relationship i mean you know the beams were still not as bright as we wanted them to be uh and the LED screens were far brighter than we ever thought we'd ever need but you know it put us in a place where we could start playing that game and then jake actually took over a lot of that responsibility after we got deeper into tech 
Yeah, so Jake, you used a couple of different shots, I know for sure in your piece, but all of the pieces. How did you go about picking which camera angle to use at which moment in the piece? And do you think that was yeah. successful in really helping your piece? Um, so, so to clarify, um, we recorded this, obviously, you didn't see the final pieces live. Um, so we put these all together um, using Premiere. Um, the difficult part about this is creating an interesting composition that's exciting for you to watch as, it's, it's, as it is exciting for us to watch as well. Um, so it's difficult for us because we only had but so much equipment on loan. Um, Max luckily has a wide angle lens on his camera. Um, one thing I learned from the post-production process is that um, getting really good footage is difficult sometimes, <laughs> even when you don't think it's going to be. Um, so we ended up going with something a little bit more consistent. Um, we had two of the cameras from the School of Film. Thank you to the School of Film for um, allowing us to use this, by the way. Um, and we kind of processed all that footage together. In terms of picking the angles, that was a conversation we had with the designers, um, talking about what is the composition we're trying to convey. Because what you saw tonight versus what we usually get in person is this very um, different experience. So when you're in person, you get to see an entire stage. And if you want to, you can get up and move to the other side of the house. But for this situation, you're not in control of it anymore. Um, and so we tried to figure out how, when even from the beginning process of developing these stories, um, how do we convey that and how do we work into the storyline because everything is connected ultimately. Um, so I was working with Yuko and with Max and their production assistants and talking about what is the story we're trying to convey um, with our visuals. Because when you see that frame in your computer screen, um, that's one picture. And so what are we trying to say with that? And what are all the objects in it? What are the angles saying in it? Um, so is my position when it comes to composing the final processed footage that you saw all night, um, it was a matter of making sure that what Yuko and Max and I wanted were really um, conveyed the best way possible to everyone else. So. so originally, I remember walking into the Large Light Lab, and you know, those of you that know the Large Light Lab know, you know how small it may be when you add 50 moving lights and a lot of video tiles. So there was a camera that was behind the video tiles at one point. Um, why did you guys get rid of that camera? Why are there no shots from behind the set? Are you asking that Who to me? Who wants to take that? Anyone. I mean, ultimately oh, we... Uh... I don't want to have to call... <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, we got rid of that camera angle from behind the set because, you know, while we like to think that, you know, cameras really open up the world, um, we still designed the set for a specific sight lane, which is the place where we tech the production from. And so we put that camera over there and the light plot was all oriented around, you know, that angle that we were teching from. And the other camera, you know, was our main composition during tech. So when we finally turned that camera on that was hidden behind those, some of those video tiles in the back of the set, just the pieces didn't make sense anymore. And it might have been fun, it might have been cool and a little bit different, but it just didn't make sense. The storytelling was lost. And sure. so we rethought yeah. it. Okay. What, um, I think to add on camera. about camera, oh, sorry. No, go for it, Yuko, please. <laughs> to, to add on about camera, I feel. This, I feel like this Photona is so special because you get these multiple perspectives of, of each composition. And it's also, you know, it's about, like Jake said, it's about conveying what story you want to tell, but it's also about what focal point you want to use to convey that story. And so having that as, you know, the fo message to, to your piece, I think is, is pretty special considering, you know, for the past, for, photon as we've had we've never really had that opportunity to use that as a design tool to tell that story okay how many of the lighting fixtures in the room were an led versus a tungsten versus an arc source um jacob i'll let you take that one yeah so we had about so 50 fixtures in the rig if i believe and all but uh i want to say 15 of them were led um, 
there was no arc lamps. Um, and then the tungsten that we did have was some source cores that you guys saw backlighting the video tiles for, um, I know communication uses them especially to kind of reveal and light the scenery. So, but most of it was LED. Okay. And, and for, in terms of, you know, um, Max or Jake or Yuko, you guys designing and having to pick colors, what was that like having that LED fixture that, you know, ultimately it can pick anything, turn on instantly, you know, no lag time. Talk about that in your pieces, especially as that relates to video. Max, I'll let you take that. Well, from the moment we walked in, um, you know, it's like we, we did have an all LED rig, but actually the, the hardest part was having um, additive mixing and subtractive mixing in an LED rig, which is, you know, Max, a common problem for most actually? designers. What, yeah, what is so, that so everyone knows? Yeah, the, the moving lights we had up in the grid were high-end system solar frames and solar wash 1000s, which have a um, LED uh, engine behind them, which is typically an arc lamp that um, drives a huge amount of light outward. And then you have color flags that mix in um, cyan, magenta, and yellow to get the colors that you want. Um, and our, basically the only difference between those solar washes and solar frames is um, it's an LED engine instead of an arc lamp, but it's still a CMY color mixing system. Um, but the rest of our LED um, fixtures were all additive mixing, which is RGB, um, and I think actually all of them were RGBW. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like red, green, blue. And so additive mixing, you use those colors and you turn them on at different intensities to make the color versus subtractive mixing is you roll in a color and it takes a certain color out. And so it really changes the way you have to think about the color that you're trying to get. And it, al it always messes me up, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was actually a huge battle was um, trying to get the, the same color out of two different color mixing systems and constantly having to switch gears to think about what's the color you need, how do you get there, and also, at the end of the day, how you get there on screen, which I think, I think, and as, as any artist, you never really get happy with. Um, you never really get happy with the perfect color on screen in those systems. So Parker, how does that, how did you handle having two different color mixing systems with a designer wanting you to make the colors all look the same? How do you go about yeah. doing that? So, I mean, you're constantly having to know, okay, if we're making a blue or whatever color, and they're trying to tell you it's too yellow, too orange, whatever, you got to know, okay, what kind of system I dealing with that subtractive because then you know, am I needing to take out a color? Or am I needing to add in a color? What colors am I? Am I am I working with? Am I taking some cyan out? Some red in? You know, so you gotta know what colors you're playing with. And, what your what your paint brush? Yes. Is so there's a there's a language that it hopefully exists between a programmer and a designer, and hopefully that language allows you to communicate to you know help convey that image. Um, so. I've got a question about going about, you know, what you guys have done. Um, originally, you know, we had talked about doing Photana um, many, many, many months ago. And you guys started working on Photana before even the pandemic had started. Let's talk a little bit about, like, how has this evolved? What, you know, what has changed from a year ago now to where we are at this moment? Um, Yuko, do you want to take that? Sure. I think the, especially the pandemic and the events that happened right after and how that affected us as a society had a huge impact in creating the theme for this year's Photana. Um, I remember back, I, I think it was March was when we first started talking about, or no, it was probably January. Um, was probably when we start talking about what we wanted to do for our own Fultana. Um But right after we got into, you know, the, um, right, right when the pandemic hit and we sort of started to realize that, oh, we, I, we, feel that we felt the urge to respond to what was happening to the society and to sort of use our art to um, tell that story in a way. Um, 
So it's definitely been a journey. Um, and I think all five pieces were inspired or in one way or another by those events. Sure. So um, do you think that, you know, if let's say that you guys had a chance to do it again, would you have done it in the large light lab? Would you have done everything the way that we've just experienced um, this photona? Is there anything you change? Jacob, no. I'll let you take that. Um, I mean, I, th I think we definitely would have liked to have done it in a different space. Um, the large light lab is the large light lab. Um, and it was great for what we did this year, but I think ideally we would have liked to be somewhere else. Um, and then I think, you know, all of us um, missed kind of what it used to be of we could sit around um, and watch all the pieces together. We could get the first years through the fourth years together in Friedman or in stage six, wherever it was the past few years. And we could watch the pieces and we could talk about them at the end of the night. And unfortunately, that wasn't something that was feasible this year. So I think that was the biggest thing I missed. And I think a lot of us missed was the ability to have everyone together and watch um, as one group and talk rather than, you know, uploading footage every night. So that way faculty and the, the underclassmen could review it and give their notes was the ability to, you know, look over to Max, who I was sitting right next to and be like, that was a really cool moment. Or what if you guys like looked at this for this music hit? Um, so I think that was the biggest thing that we'd like to do differently or and missed out on this year was everyone just being together. Yeah. For sure, the sense of community is certainly something that we're all suffering with right now. Um, so I, I totally understand that. So going back, um, Jake, can you talk a little bit about what you know what Photana typically would have been and how that works for those of the audience that don't know? Yeah. So for some context for anyone I know, Photana actually has a lot of. Um, new people that come to it every year. And we're really, really grateful to get to meet with those people. Um, and this year's a little bit weird because we don't get to physically meet you, um, which is obviously sad for many reasons. Um, for what it used to be, um, Photana, it started, um, at least when I was here, we've come into the Friedman Theater most years. So Friedman Theater is one of the performance facilities on our campus. Um, it's a large um, three quarters round space. It's getting a renovation this year, which is really exciting for all of our um, upper coming students. Um, but previously we, we would have been in there. Um, so we would have been doing this, this big light show, a lot more equipment. Um, year, was it last year, year before last, last year, I believe, we, um, we were actually in Soundstage 6, um, which is from the School of Film. Um, that was incredibly weird challenge for us because um, Soundstage 6 is a soundstage. It's just a big empty shell with a grid that lowers. Um, so it made it incredibly easy to work, um, but it was a bit different in terms of how our audience was set up. Um, so we actually fed off of that some talking about this year because Friedman Theater is still in its renovation process and it's actually nearing completion. Um, we're really excited to see that progress, but for some obvious reasons, being a pandemic, we can't be with you in person. Um, so when it comes to how we had to sculpt this, obviously we've worked with cameras. Um, from what Photana used to be though, uh, multimedia you were coming in you were sitting down um and you were really able to immerse yourself in it and so one of the things that our big focus was on is how can we immerse the audience that's watching on a computer or a phone or a tv into this experience because for me personally one of the biggest things about lighting and this might sound kind of cliche but um just the feeling of having a, a moving light and a template just wash over you you feel like you're you're part of the experience all of a sudden and when we're on a computer, how do you get that? Um, so we talked about that. How can we use lens flares? How can we use editing? Um, and I mean, there's nothing that's ever going to replace previous photonas. If you haven't attended a previous photona or you want to in the future when it's back in person again, please do. By all means, please do. Um, there is nothing that can replace it. So this is our best um, try this year at giving uh, continuation of this idea because it is a continuing story every year. So. 
Sure. Yeah, we we just started uh, classes picked up, I guess, what, three weeks ago? Um, just yeah. over. We just finished our third week back. So not only have they been doing their traditional classes during the day in production, they're also in the large light lab or in what well, we've converted into another classroom um, to do previs. They've been working on their pieces uh, at that point. Um, so, uh, you know, it's I, in some ways you guys have had, I feel, less time to accomplish what you've been able to accomplish and still put out you know, the same quality product, which is uh, pretty impressive. So for those five of you sitting in the room right now, what's happening this weekend for you? Um, we have quite a lot going on on the School of the Arts, uh, not campus, but on, um, uh, uh, it's called Remo, which um, I'll let Parker, if you wanna kind of start us off talking about what's happening and everyone else can pick up the topic is job fair uh usually here on campus uh where we're usually able to bring around 50 companies uh to campus and uh, have interviews with them and meet and network uh fortunately that's in a uh zoom online format this year or remo uh, so that is what we will be taking care of this weekend is meeting with a variety of companies, uh, some hiring, some not, uh, and trying to, you know, make our next move. Yeah, so um, this weekend, everyone's going to be doing interviews. They're going to be presenting uh, their digital portfolios or their websites. So, you know, if you go to the, uh, the link tree, that we provided everyone with. There's a link to every student's um, digital portfolio or website. So, you know, we encourage you all to take a look at that. Um, the other thing that I kind of want to wrap up with, there's a group of students that I want to make sure that we thank. Um, we have um, coming to you live, we're actually using a software platform called vMix. And um, I just want to make sure that we do a, a special call out for those students. So it's, uh, it's going to be Malcolm, and it's Taylor and Frankie and Gray. They've done an amazing job assembling what we've done on on vMix, bringing this all to you live. Uh, we've, you know, we filmed everything at the beginning of the week. We've done rehearsals the last two days, and uh, they've really done an amazing job being able to put this live out on Facebook and on YouTube. So um, I think with that. We're going to wrap up Photana 2021 for the class of 2021. And thank you all for coming. And I hope you guys all stay safe. And we'll see you next year, hopefully in Friedman Theater. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.